David begins Psalm 3 by focusing most directly on the things that are happening in his life, the things that are immediate in his face, the things that he can see and touch and feel. He starts by focusing on his enemies, recognizing that that's where the problem lies. He almost immediately shifts that focus. He doesn't stay with the enemies for long. He immediately moves to talking to God and about God, the one who holds a solution to the problems that he's dealing with. David uses the phrase, you Lord are a shield around me. That word shield is really kind of interesting. According to uh, our commentators, there are two ways of looking at the word shield. The first one is the one that probably comes most immediately to mind. It's the idea of a defensive weapon, something that the, the soldier would use in battle, a physical implement that provides protection. David um, uses the same kind of imagery in Psalm 18, when he says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my mountain where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. There's not much there that's not metaphorical. There's not much there that isn't an image drawn from the real world, the physical, observable world not the real world, the observable world, that people aren't going to use as a mental hook to help them to understand something about who God is and how he is interacting with David. Poetry is like that. It uses everyday images to help us to understand, in this case, what Yahweh is like. And many translators of the Bible over the years who have been translating it from the original Hebrew into English use um, translations like, the Lord is like a shield, or the Lord is my shield, or the Lord is an impenetrable shield, or the Lord is a covering around me. Or sometimes they will verbify shield, and they will say, you shield me, you protect me drawing on that image of what in David's time would have been a um, wooden carved plate or uh, a piece of cured leather stretched out over a wood frame or even um, just woven branches and leaves that, that formed a, a mat that would stand between the soldier and the enemy's weapon, whether it was a sword or a shield. A shield in that context is something that you pick up and you hold in front and you use and you put it into practice and you put it into use. And in that respect, that metaphor works. That metaphor works for what David is saying because David is hanging on to Yahweh. Yahweh is what stands between him and the worst that can happen to him. Um, David is, is acknowledging and applying his faith in God as a buffer between himself and what he fears and the fact that he, he might struggle with doubt or discouragement or heartbreak. God is David's shield. It's a thing that David holds up in front of himself as a reminder as well that God has spoken that God has kept his promises and he will continue to keep his promises. God is David's shield. The second possible understanding of the word shield is one that I think is even more interesting, even more probably what David had in mind when he penned these words. Rather than the shield being an object of protection, 
That word was used at that time as a word that was a title for a person. Now that person, the other word that we might come across, you might, maybe in a crossword puzzle, I don't know, not in everyday conversation, but the word that you might come across to, under, to explain, to define what that shield relationship was, is the word suzerain, S-U-Z-E-R-A-I-N. A suzerain was uh, a king with whom you would make a deal, with whom you would cut a covenant, in the, in the terminology of the day. Um, uh, if, um, if I were uh, David, I were in charge of, of my, uh, my territory, my nation, and there was a stronger king next door, I might uh, accept him as my, my partner in pr mutual protection, uh, make a treaty with him and say, if I am attacked by my enemies, you have to come and help me. And the other king would say the same thing. If they were attacked, I would be expected to come and help him. So it could be uh, a relationship of equals, but more often it was a relationship where someone had greater power, someone had lesser power. So the one who had greater power would grant to the one with lesser power the right to rule his own area, his own city, his own nation, in exchange for some financial support and for, again, practical support if the greater king were attacked by his enemies. So we have a greater king and a lesser king who have made a deal, who have made a covenant of mutual support. But there is one king who is more powerful and who has the right to punish the lesser king if he breaks the covenant. You see how that connects with David's situation. In, uh, in Psalm 84, it's kind of interesting. David uses the word shield again, but he uses it in a way that comes across differently. He says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Here we have a shield that gives good things. We have a shield that provides good things for those who live with integrity. Those who hold their side of the covenant. This verse sounds like a suzerain relationship between David and God. Uh, another place where we see that kind of idea is much farther back in the story of David, or of, of um, God's relationship with the people of Israel. When God is first making his deal with Abram, he says to Abram, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your reward will be very great. The shield will provide a reward to those who live with integrity. God is David's suzerain. He is David's shield. He is the king over David's kingship. Part of the suzerain's role is to provide support for the lesser partner in the deal. And in, in Psalm uh, 3, in that situation, we see how God provides for David. David is provided with basically a head start because um, someone informs on Absalom and says, this is what's happening, you need to get out of town. God provides through a man named Etai the Gittite, who was not an Israelite citizen. He was uh, an exile from uh, the Philistine nation. And if you remember Goliath, well, Etai would have been cheering for Goliath when David knocked him down. But Etai has discovered a new, um, a new loyalty 
a new nation. And he ties himself in with David and provides him with troops and with a vote of confidence. David is provided with, uh, with faith support from his faith community, from the priests, from the temple, from the religious leader who worship with him before David has to leave the city and who pray with him and say, we will do what we need to do to support you. We will pray for you. David is provided with, uh, with friends. A man named Hushai the Archite agrees to stay in the city and basically be a, a double agent, sending messages through the priests to David about what Absalom is doing and how David might need to respond. David is provided with practical help with donkeys and bread and fruit and wine by a man named Ziba, who was the servant of Mephibosheth, who you may remember from last week. Mephibosheth was the one who sat back on his hands and just waited for David to fall apart because his, fill, his heart was uh, just filled with resentment and bitterness. But Ziba went against Mephibosheth and snuck out of the house with whatever supplies he could round up on short notice and he provided those things for David. These are all ways in which God, David's shield provided. His shield didn't just stand in front of him and knock the arrows back. The shield provided good things for David, as long as David continued to live a life of integrity. As long as David continued to keep his part of God's covenant. Now, when I chose to become a follower of Jesus, when I chose to become a believer in Jesus and who he claims to be, I said yes to that kind of a relationship. God is my suzerain. I accepted the kingship of Jesus over my life and yes, that means that I gave him some authority over how I live. I gave him the right to make some demands on me. And sometimes those demands are not easy. And sometimes it's really hard to walk that path. But that is my part of that relationship, that I accepted his kingship over me. At the same time, I... I I'm glad to accept the fact that he has promised to provide and to protect and to stand with me no matter what happens. And sometimes the meeting of those needs and the answers to those prayers takes time. Sometimes those answers are not what I expect, not necessarily what I want. And we'll see how David's story plays out and how some of the answers to his prayers were not what he expected at all. So I have accepted the kingship of Jesus over my life, but I also acknowledge that he has given me kingship over the, the, the aspects of my life over which I have control. That like in, in the story of Adam and Eve, right from the beginning, God put them in the garden. He put them to work to watch over the earth. They were the kings of their domain. God was the king over them. In the other opposite end of the scriptures, in the book of Revelation, we, uh, we read that God makes the believers, the followers, kingdom, kings and priests over the earth, and we will reign on the earth. The idea of suzerainty, of being or having a suzerain is a relationship of acknowledgement and trust and passing on the good that we receive to those around us who need to receive that good. If God is my suzerain, if Jesus is my suzerain, I know that I can trust him. 
I know that whatever comes, he will be with me. And sometimes that's all you need to know. Yeah.